Good morning, Menachem. Good morning. Uh, my name is Randy Freed. Uh, for those of you, of course, joining us live uh, at JD with the World Jewish Congress, um, it really is a a pleasure to be with General Counsel and the Associate Executive Vice President of the World Jewish Congress, Nachum Rosenstaff, this morning talking about Holocaust remembrance in the age of COVID-19. Um, Menachem, before we get to your article uh, that was published in the Times of Israel, I, I wanted just to touch base a little bit about your background um, because it it's quite unique that you are born of a group and from a place uh, where there never was or will be again uh, people born, and that is the Bergen-Belsen DP camp um, and born in 1948. So if you first share maybe a little bit about your background. Well, both my parents were survivors of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, and they were at Bergen-Belsen at the time of liberation on April 15th, 1945. Now, Bergen-Belsen was a horrific place at that moment because of a raging typhus epidemic and other diseases. And so it became the first real focal point for post-Holocaust rescue. In other words, the British had to figure out what to do with some 58,000 survivors of whom the vast majority were ill and on the verge of death. And the fact is that some 14,000 died during the two months after liberation. What the British did was move all the survivors within a month to a nearby army, army base, German army base, which became the emergency hospital and then transitioned into the displaced persons camp of Bergen-Belsen, which existed from 1945 to 1950. And in that form, it was uh, the DP camp was actually in existence longer than the concentration camp, which had existed from 1943 to 1950. It was a center of Jewish life and rebirth in which the survivors were able to find themselves again and rebuild their lives again. And in one of the most dramatic testaments to resilience and um, determination to go forward, uh, over 2,000 children, myself among them, were born in Bergen-Belsen in the DP camp between 1945 and 1950. And if, as you mentioned correctly, no one had that distinction before, no one ever will again. And we are really a manifestation, a reflection of our parents' not just survival, but victory over those who had sought to destroy them. A quick note, if you wish to make a comment or have a question, please feel free to use the chat uh, feature and send us your comment or question. So Menachem, you were just saying or finishing your comment about being from that unique place. Uh, I, leading into the article that you wrote, I'm curious as to, uh, I'm curious about how being born of such a unique place, being a part of a, a generation or a group really of people that have this unique connection to one another, uh, knowing the story of your parents, what, uh, First, what is the reflections you have uh, coming into 2020 with all of us? I have a sense that uh, the technical difficulties are continuing. So until such time as uh, we get, let me try to answer your question. Uh, the issue really is one of perspective. We are today in the midst of a global pandemic, a global uh, crisis of unprecedented proportions. And in some ways, our parents' example, our parents' legacy, as it were, helps us these days. It helps us because we are able to put things into perspective. 
at some stage, uh, they went through far worse than we did. They were directly persecuted while we are not. But at the same time, they were forced into ghettos and death camps while we are living in comfortable homes and are not being attacked as Jews or as any other particular group. At the same time, we all are now subject to a fear. We are all throughout the world scared. We are all dealing with an enemy who is attacking humankind as a whole, and we have no assurance of what tomorrow brings. We all watch as families are disrupted. To be sure, we have Zoom, we have other, we have FaceTime, we can be in contact, but we are still isolated and alone. And what I think we can learn from our parents and where the DP camp example to me is relevant is that we see an ability to prevail, an ability to look forward, an ability not to let the fear of the moment, the anxieties, the very real horrors of the moment, which in this instance means see, knowing that people we know are critically ill, knowing that people we know with whom we spend time only uh, a month or two ago have passed away. And, and we dealing with that, we also have to realize that there will be a tomorrow, there will be a future, and we are in a process of moving through this. But at the same time, maybe one of the things that we, we, the global communities, and even we, the uh, second and third and fourth generations, are getting a sense of isolation and the fears that our parents and European Jewry at the time of the Holocaust experienced. Uh, I'm saying that because during the time of the Holocaust, the rest of the world was disconnected from the Jews there. Uh, during the time of the Holocaust at Passover, Jews in New York and Tel Aviv and Melbourne and Toronto celebrated the Seder in 1943, while Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto had to do so against the backdrop of bomb and uh, gunfire, machine gunfire. Uh, and at a time when my parents in their respective ghettos sat down for a Seder with their families, relatively certain that this would be the last time that they would ever sit together as a family. And there was a disconnect because it was almost impossible for anyone who was not there to really put themselves in that position. Today, humankind as a whole, Jews, Christian, Muslims, rich, poor, Americans, Europeans, Australians, we are Africans, we are all facing the same enemy. We all understand what the other is going through. I think for the first time, there is an understanding, a universal understanding of what it means to be under attack and having no real form at the moment of fighting against the enemy. So it's an interesting, an interesting question. I wonder what that, or interesting thought. Um, so knowing, right, that we're, as a world community, we're fighting against this, we are fighting against a, uh, this universal threat, if you will. Uh, I'm curious how the Jewish experience, uh, especially in terms of, as we come into Yom HaShoah, um, 
what the lesson there then is about how how do we remember knowing that we're I mean, we're going through it but at the same time we're coming to a time of of remembrance um and as you had mentioned even uh about bergen belson the notion that uh or not a notion um remarking quite correctly that bergen belson in the gp camp became a very unique place of jewish life there was artistry there was there was this uh resurgence and renaissance if you will of of life so i'm just curious how that how the how we set that and that notion of, of hope against what seems like a uh, insurmountable pandemic look there are two mindsets and there always have been two mindsets in dealing with tragedy one is to allow the tragedy to engulf you to engulf one and to succumb to it and it's a perfectly understandable reaction it is one of despair it is one of hopelessness and it is basically one of giving up the other is a determination to do everything possible to move forward to do everything possible not to allow the horrors of the moment the despair of the moment to engulf one the ability to maintain a sense of humor the ability to maintain some kind of humanity is critical uh, we are seeing it today quite frankly in the actions and behaviors around the world of the first responders. Uh, we are seeing it in those who could very easily not show up for work because they are taking they are more con they're concerned about their own well-being. And yet with inadequate equipment, with inadequate protective gear, with inadequate masks, they are on the front line taking care of people who are dying or who are critically ill and helping them recover and what i'm trying to what i'm trying to get across is we need to focus on what is happening around us with a perspective of making through it now with respect to holocaust remembrance look we have we all understand that holocaust remembrance will change with the generations it cannot be a static uh, sterile act that gets one once a year or twice a year to commit to remembrance because if it's that it's meaningless what it what it requires is for us to see the shoah to see the holocaust through the prism of our own perspective and our own perspective at the moment, the perspective of COVID-19. It is a perspective of 2020. It is a perspective of being aware of the fact that the survivor generation is dwindling, not because of any other reasons, but it's a biological reality. And that becomes worsened by the fact that because of their age, survivors end up being a disproportionate part of the those who succumb to the disease. And it just makes the pain greater, but it also means that our generation and your generation now have the responsibility of taking what we learned from the survivors, what we heard, their testimony which we have listened to and we now have the responsibility of carrying that into the future and absorbing it into our own consciousness and making it our own uh, you know there is a at the passover seder there is the line that in every generation it is incumbent on one to see oneself as if we came out of egypt 
Well, the same is true with the with Holocaust remembrance. It is not incumbent on us to see ourselves as if we had been in Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen. We cannot do that and we should never do that. But it is incumbent on us to see ourselves as the witnesses of those who did and to take the lessons we learned from them and make sure that they are relevant to our lives and become a lesson to carry forward. Thank you. I, I'm curious with that. So then, so we, we're, I'm noticing a number of comments which mention, right, there's a classic phrase that we see around Holocaust remembrance of never forget. Um, though you and I would agree, perhaps, that uh, that never forget is something that, although we continue to say it, we know that genocides and other forms on smaller scales have happened since the Shoah. And I'm just curious how, um, you know, when talking about putting it, in, putting it through the lens of our own experience to try on some level to understand what happened, to remember, um, where does never forget fit in? Well, two things. First, let me just make one small correction. Uh, there are no smaller genocides. There just may be genocide of different scope. From the perspective of the victims and their families, it really does not matter if it's 100,000 or 200,000 or 50,000 or 6 million. Uh, just as it does not matter whether there were gas chambers or not. I have, I have never come across a survivor of the Rwanda genocide who said, oh, it wasn't gas chambers, it was just machetes, I feel so much better. So let's understand that every genocide, every tragedy of this kind is worthy of exactly the same kind of reverence and the same kind of memory. And quite frankly, if we don't remember other people's tragedies, we have no reason to complain if they don't remember ours. The second part, though, is never forget means it requires no knowledge beforehand. You cannot forget something you never knew. So that in order to implement never forget or never again, you first have to make sure that all of us, and this is way beyond the Jewish community, that all of us actually know what happened, that education becomes the central point of our commemorative experiences, that we must make sure that school children, teenagers, university students, all know what happened so that you don't have our primary enemy not being neo-Nazis on the march, but the ignorance among those who watch it and who do not have an understanding of what it means when neo-Nazis are on the march. Do you th uh, think that, and by the way, a very, a very valid point, uh, and nor was I trying to suggest there are lesser genocides. Um, uh, uh, I think I was referring to scale. What I'd be curious then, following that line of thinking then, is if, obviously, you're alluding to education. There is a requirement and a need that never again and, and never forget really, um, uh, I would say, is a challenge to all of us that we must, one, be educated ourselves, and two, uh, educate, help educate others. Uh, do you think that the pandemic experience where it's a global experience of sheltering uh, in place and while certainly not the same, uh, giving us perhaps a glimpse of, of being afraid of something. Um, do you think perhaps that opens a door for people being um, more willing to learn about uh, the Shoah and intolerance of the other? I don't think we've ever had an unwillingness to learn. What we've had is perhaps 
not enough motivation to teach. What we've had, we've always had the audiences that if you gave them the material, were listening. Uh, the question is, how much time will a teacher of a social studies or history course devote to, uh, to the Holocaust, devote to fighting anti-Semitism, devote to explaining exactly why white supremacism and neo-Nazism is as virulent in the 21st century as it was in the 20th. And one of the realities that we are facing right now as a result of the sheltering in place is that we are learning more and more about the strengths of the internet. It is both a weakness because it is a way for uh, bigots and um, xenophobes to transmit their um, noxious views, but it's also a tremendous educational tool. Look, I'll give you an example. You spoke to you earlier about Bergen Belsen, about the DP camp. Most people have no idea about it, not because they don't want to, but it's just not been on their radar screen. We produced, we were going to have a commemoration at Bergen Belsen, and we were going to bring uh, over 50 of the children who were born there back there. Well, this got aborted uh, back in March when we realized we could not do it. But instead, we produced the World Jewish Congress, together with the World Federation of Bergen Belsen Associations, produced a video, an 11 minute video about the DP camp, about the children born there, about what its significance. That video exists. It is now an educational tool. We have also created German, French, Russian, Spanish, and Portuguese versions of it. And we are in the process of creating a Hebrew version of it. So that we now have a way of making sure that those people who want to know will also be given the tools. And if we use the internet as a proactive, constructive tool, I suspect we will be far more effective and far better positioned to use it than those who want to use it as an instrument to propagate hatred. Very nice. I think that that is our time for today. I didn't see any questions come up in our live chat. Um, first and foremost, uh, Menachem, it's always a pleasure to see you, um, General Counsel and Associate Executive Vice President of the World Jewish Congress. Uh, thank you for this your time this morning. Uh, for those watching, I also want to let you know that stay tuned uh, for at 11 a.m. We have the World Jewish Congress Yom HaShoah commemoration. And also want to let you know for tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Central European Time, Carol Farkopan of UNESCO will be speaking uh, about preventing genocide through education. Uh, I'm Randy Fried, a part of the Jewish Diplomatic Corps of the World Jewish Congress. Thank you for tuning in to the WJC Web Talk.